Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, That Model Railway Guy, and welcome to another layout update on the Modular Model Railway. Now, you may remember in the previous episode I built two brand new curved modules which allowed me to complete the entire circuit, and now I can run trains around continuously. And we're going to be sticking with one of those modules today because I'm actually going to be doing the groundworks to start some of the scenery on it. Now, at the other end of the layout, I have the track going underneath a bridge, and that is to disguise the join to the fiddle yard. The idea being that you see trains disappear underneath the bridge and out of sight, rather than just going through a little hole in the back scene and into the fiddle yard beyond. I wanted to do something similar on this new end of the layout as well, uh, to disguise the join into the fiddle yard, but I didn't want to just have another bridge, because I thought, well, I've already done that, so let's try and do something different, let's mix it up a bit, and I thought, let's have a tunnel, because everybody loves a tunnel, don't they? I've never actually built a tunnel before, so I don't know how this is going to go. I have a rough idea of what I'm going to do, but it's not really like a proper plan or anything, so I'm just going to kind of wing it and hope that it works. But um, yeah, we'll see how this goes. One thing I do want to do, though, is make sure I have some interior detail inside the tunnel. A bit of a pet peeve of mine is when you see these wonderfully modelled layouts that have incredible scenery and towns and buildings and everything, and it looks fantastic. And then you get down at eye level and you look into a tunnel and you realise inside it's it's bare baseboards and the track hasn't been ballasted and there's bits of polystyrene and duct tape holding everything together and it just kind of breaks the illusion a little bit and so for me I want to make sure that I've got a little bit of interior detail inside my tunnel. It's not going to be a very long tunnel since I'm only really modelling the tunnel mouth and then a little bit of the hill behind it so I don't really know how much scenery I'm going to be able to get in there but I'm hoping I can at least ballast the track which will make it look a bit better so that's where I'm actually going to start today is with ballasting. Um, it's it's difficult enough to ballast track when you're just doing it normally, but it gets even more tricky, I imagine, when you're trying to do it inside a tunnel. So I'm going to start off with that first and then build the rest of the tunnel over it. So uh, yeah, that's how we're going to kick things off today. Let's get to it, shall we? So here's one of the modules that I built last time, and the first thing to do will be to mark the position of the tunnel. This is the tunnel portal that I'm using, don't worry you'll get a closer view of it later on. And I'm just marking a very rough position on where I want the opening to be. And then, like I said, I wanted to get the ballast down before building the tunnel. And for me, the first step of ballasting is to weather the track. So here you can see I'm just painting the sides of the rails. I did have a few comments on a previous video saying it would be much quicker to do this using an airbrush. And I agree, it probably would. However, I don't own an airbrush and I quite like the simplicity of doing it by hand. With an airbrush, it's another piece of gear that I've got to get out and set up and maintain and make sure that it's working properly where at the moment all I need is a brush and some paint. And of course this isn't to say that you shouldn't use an airbrush, there are loads of modelers who can do fantastic things with them and get great results. Unfortunately I'm just not one of them. <laughs> anyway, with the sides painted I then moved on to painting the chairs in a rusty orange colour. As always this looks really bright when you first put it on, but then I go back over it with the brush afterwards and blend it all in, and don't forget it'll tone down when it dries as well. I have to admit, this isn't the best work I've ever done when it comes to weathering track, but I can always touch it up later. Really, the focus right now is on just getting the bit that'll be inside the tunnel looking passable, and then the rest of the module is a bonus. And then it was time for the actual ballasting itself. As you know, I like to start off with a small area and then gradually spread it along the track. I think I said this in the tutorial I did on ballasting your own layout, but I find it's really worth taking the time to get this stage right. Spend as much time as you need to get it all into the right position because once you get the glue on, you can't really change it. And then here you can see that before I glued all the ballast down, I misted it with some water. Then using the classic mix of PVA and water with a few drops of washing up liquid, it was time to start adding the glue.
It does take quite a long time to dry, so I found you have to leave it at least overnight, but usually I wait a full day just to be safe. So with that said, while it's drying, let's move on to the tunnel mouth itself. This is the tunnel portal I'm using. It's from the Pico model scene range, and to be honest, it's a bit cheap. It cost me around five pounds, and you can see here that it's got some nice molded detail, but there are issues like these marks that we're used to seeing on plastic items. That said, it's simple but effective, and I think I can make it look a lot better with just a bit of paint. So first up, I removed some of the flashing and the excess plastic. I was also able to cut away those ejector pin marks too, and I did my best to scribe the stone detail back into the plastic. Now I'm going to put a few different coats of paint on this, and the first one is this sort of sand colour, and with this I just want a nice even coat all over the entire tunnel mouth. Then when that was dry, I painted it all again, this time in a grey, and I know what you're thinking, it was already grey, so why am I doing this? Well, what I'm going to do now is use a tissue to dab away some of the grey paint, which reveals the tan colour underneath. And once again, I'll do this over the entire model. And now that it's dry, you can see how the two colours mix together like this create a really nice look with lots of random patches to create that variation in the stone colour. By the way, if you're wondering, yes, this is a double track portal, and I do realise that my layout is only a single line. The reason I've gone for a double track one is because the tunnel is on a curve, so it gives me some extra clearance. But also, as my layout is a heritage railway, I'm imagining that originally it was a double track line, but the Preservation Society have only restored it as a single track, as is the case on most heritage railways. And if you look closely, I actually did the same with the bridge at the other end of my layout as well. Next up is the final step in painting this tunnel, and for this I'll need some white acrylic paint. I brush the white paint onto the tunnel, doing just a small area at a time, and I make sure that I get into all the nooks and crannies. And then I just wipe it away with a bit of tissue. Everything on the surface will get removed, but the paint that was down in the gaps between the stones remains, and this gives a really nice impression of the mortar that would be used to hold everything together. Here you can see a comparison before and after, and I think it really makes a huge difference. So that is essentially the paint job I did on the tunnel mouth, and I think it's looking a lot better already. I did say I wanted to add some interior detailing though, so let's have a look at that now. First off, I'm going to start with these strips of moulded stone plastic card that I've cut from a sheet. This is from the Slater's Plasticard range, and this sheet was actually intended for O-gauge models, but it was a pretty good match for the large stone blocks I had on the tunnel already. As you can see, I started off by painting this grey, and then dabbing away some of the excess, just like I did previously on the tunnel mouth. The only difference this time is that I didn't paint the whole thing in that sandy tan colour first. The original colour of the plastic was pretty much that already, so I was able to skip that step. And then again, as before, I use the white paint to accent the gaps between the stones. Next up, I have another sheet of plastic card, which this time has a brick pattern moulded on. This particular sheet is already a decent brick colour, so I'll add some variation with a bit of brown, just dabbing it on in a few areas, and then spreading it around and wiping it away. This makes the brick look less uniform, and I imagine it would get pretty dirty inside a tunnel anyway, so we hardly expect it to look perfect. It's quite a subtle effect, but as you can see here, now that I've covered the entire sheet with these little marks, it's starting to make a bit of a difference.
And then, yep, you guessed it, more white paint to highlight the detail and bring out those gaps between the bricks. It did occur to me after this that maybe I should have used more of a cream colour instead of a white between the bricks, but it doesn't really matter all that much and I can always weather it later on if it does bother me. The great thing with the Slater's plastic card is it's quite thin, which means I can bend it easily to use as the interior lining on the inside of the tunnel. So now I'm going to try and put this all together and hopefully you'll see where I'm going with this. First I cut the stone strip in half. And then I glued one part to the side of the brick sheet. And then the second half on the other side. Going back to the tunnel mouth, you can see on the reverse it's got a bit of a slot along the back where I'm planning to insert my plastic card interior. So first I sort of tried folding it and rolling it up a bit just to make it easier to curve. And then I added some glue onto the back of the tunnel. And then it was just a case of fitting the interior in place. Although that was easier said than done as every time I got one side in, the other would inevitably pop back out again. It did take a few attempts, but when it was dry, this was the finished result, and I have to say I'm really happy with this. Considering what it looked like before I started, it just goes to show what a bit of work and some paint can do. Back to the baseboard now, and with the ballast dry, it was time to start preparing for the tunnel installation. First I painted this whole area in a very dark brown that's actually almost black so that if you look inside the tunnel you won't just see the bare plywood. Also because it's almost black hopefully it'll make it look much darker inside the tunnel too. And now I'll add the newly finished tunnel portal and you can see here I'm just getting it into position. Next I glued down two large polystyrene blocks on either side of the track. And these are going to act as pillars which will hold up the landscape that goes above the track. And then just to be safe and because they were bright white I also painted the sides that might be seen through the tunnel entrance. Previously I've used polystyrene blocks to do my landscape, but when I have to do large areas like this I find it's much more effective to use chicken wire. It's a bit of an old fashioned technique I think, but I have a lot of this wire hanging around for some reason and there always seems to be offcuts going spare that I can make use of. Anyway, this is really going to form the basic structure of the land that goes over the tunnel, although it does need a little bit of the excess cutting away in some areas just to get it to fit round the tunnel mouth properly. And then to fix the chicken wire down to the baseboard I actually used a staple gun. And that's holding it in place nicely so it won't be going anywhere anytime soon. Then naturally I just repeated this on the other side. The final step now was to put a layer of paper mache over the top of the chicken wire to create a basic shell. I didn't want any glue to drop down onto the track though, so you can see I'm protecting it here with some newspaper before I get started. And then it was time to add the paper mache itself, which is just strips of newspaper soaked in glue on either side. And then I just kept building it up until I felt like everything was fully covered, but as you can see it did take a while. This was some good old fashioned messy modelling, so I didn't mind that it took a while, but I won't make you sit through all that now, so let's skip ahead to when it had all dried. So, the paper mache is now dry, and you can kind of see that the basic shape of the landform is starting to emerge. I am going to put a layer of plaster bandage on this eventually as well. The reason I started off with paper mache is that I find the plaster bandage gets quite heavy when you soak it in water and it sort of tends to sink down into the chicken wire which means you get a kind of 
uh, an imprint of the pattern of the, the wire mesh underneath, which doesn't look particularly realistic. But the paper mache, because it's so much lighter, just sort of sits on top of the chicken wire. And so when it dries, you get this sort of smoother looking shell. Although it is still quite delicate and sort of movable. So uh, if this was a permanent layout, it would probably be fine. You could probably just add a few more layers of paper mache over the top of this. Because this is a portable layout though that I'm gonna be moving around quite a lot, I just wanna be absolutely belt and braces certain that I know it's solid. And so I'm gonna put a layer of plaster bandage over the top of this as well, just to make sure that it is really rock hard. Before I do that though, I am gonna construct a backboard which will close off the back of the tunnel. Obviously I'm gonna have a little hole so that the trains can pass through into the fiddle yard, but mostly this is just to block out as much excess light as possible so that it looks as dark as possible inside the tunnel. I'm hoping as well that it'll also protect the back of the scenery here, much like the fascias that I've added on other parts of the layout where I've needed to protect the sides of the scenery. In this case, it'll just be protecting the back. So. That's kind of how I'm gonna construct it really. By the way, if you do wanna know how to construct a fascia, I have done a video on that already as part of my Model Railway Basics series. There should be a little link at the top of the screen now which you can click if you want to see uh, an in-depth tutorial on how to make those. Um, but yeah, that's the basic technique that I'm gonna use for creating this backboard here. I am gonna adapt it slightly though because I would like to sort of have a removable access panel if possible that I can kind of take off and get in there just so that if there ever is a derailment inside the tunnel or something, I can go in safely from the back where there's lots of space. Uh, it also means that it makes it a lot easier for getting in to clean the track as well. I'm still quite old fashioned. I do everything with a track rubber or by hand at least rather than having a loco that whizzes around with a little uh, track rubber on it anyway. So yeah, like I said, I don't really have a plan for how I'm gonna do this other than I'm sort of gonna follow the basic technique I used for creating the fascias. Let's get to it. This is the bit of wood I'm using, and it's actually the back of an IKEA wardrobe that I've been gradually using up as I add more fascias to the layout. Before this, I chipped away a small cutout at the bottom just so it would slot over the track and sit flat on the baseboard. With the wood in place, I then marked out the rough height of the landscape, which will give me a guide on where to cut. And just briefly moving outside so that I can cut the wood, you can see that I've added a few extra marks to it. This first one is the hole which will allow trains to pass from the tunnel module through to the fiddle yard. And then this larger one is the cutout for the access panel I'll be adding later. So without further ado, out came the jigsaw and it was time to get cutting. So after all that, this is the main piece that will go on the back of the tunnel, and obviously it has quite a large hole where the access panel will go. I'm planning to use magnets to hold the panel in place, and so to do that I've made up these three little tabs. These are actually the same magnets I used for my removable coal loads video that I made a while back. I still had a few left over, and so I was easily able to spare a few for this project. The tabs were glued around the edge of the hole, one on each side, and the bits of wood they're stuck to just hold the magnet at the right depth so that when the panel goes on later, it'll be flush with the rest of the backboard. They're not particularly pretty, but I can always tidy them up later on, and remember, 99% of the time you won't be able to see these anyway. Then this is the access panel, and you can see I've glued on another set of magnets to the back which line up perfectly with the ones on the backboard. And this means that when they get close to each other, the panel snaps into place. And now it was time to attach the board to the back of the tunnel. To do that, I needed something to actually fix it to, so I cut these little blocks of wood which I'll use to nail the backboard to. And using a bit of PVA, I glued the blocks to the baseboard and I was really careful here to leave a bit of an inset again so that the backboard would sit flush with the rest of the frame. And once the glue was dry, the backboard was moved into position and then I was simply able to tack it into place. I may add some extra support later on in the future if I feel like it's needed, but for now this certainly seems strong enough, especially considering that it's just a finishing piece. And that was the last bit of the structure in place, so now I can go ahead and add plaster bandage all over the top of the tunnel.
With the majority of the plaster bandage down, it was then time to move the tunnel into place. Again, I used PVA for this simply because it doesn't need to be stuck down too hard, just enough to hold it down as the rest of the scenery should keep it in place. And also, if I do ever need to adjust it, the PVA won't be too hard to break. With the glue on the bottom, I was then able to slide it into position, and finally it looks like a proper tunnel. I did have to do a little bit of adjusting here and there, but nothing drastic, and you can see it's sitting nice and flat on the surface of the baseboard. There are a few gaps around the edges though, which do need to be filled in. I did this deliberately so I could fit the tunnel in, but now that it's in place, I can use the plaster bandage to bring the landscape right up to the side of the wings. I also did the same over the top as well, just to cover the initial part of the tunnel. I imagine in the future I'll fill this out even more with some modelling compound when I come to do the scenery, but for now this will do nicely. Thankfully plaster bandage doesn't take too long to dry, and so with that the structure of the tunnel is now complete. Obviously there isn't any scenery on this yet, and I'm going to do all that in one go. Um, what I'm going to do is fill in this sort of landscape in these kind of big blank areas that you can see here, uh, and sort of blend the hill down into that a little bit so it's not too much of a sharp drop off. Once I've sorted out the landform for the entire module, then I'll paint the whole thing brown and do all the scenery like the static grass and adding foliage and stuff. And so by doing that all in one go, it'll look a lot more consistent, I think, rather than sort of doing it bits at a time. And you can kind of end up seeing which bits you've done at an earlier date and which bits you did later on. So yeah, that's the plan anyway. I'll show all that in a later video, but hopefully that's not too far away now. One last thing I do want to talk about though is my little removable access panel around the back of the tunnel. And if I just demonstrate now, you can see that comes out without any trouble at all. I'm really pleased with how this has come out actually. Considering I didn't really have a plan for this and I was just sort of making it up as I went along, um, yeah, really impressed with how that has come out. And it means it's so much easier to be able to get my hand right in there to be able to clean the track and, and sort out derailed locos and carriages and stuff like that. So yeah, and then putting it back on is just as easy as well. In fact, it's even easier in my opinion because it just snaps into place thanks to those magnets. So uh, yeah, it's perhaps a bit overkill on a tunnel that is this short, but if you're building a layout that has a really long tunnel, for example, you might want to think about putting a little removable access panel in like I have done because it does make it so much easier to get in there just in case anything does happen in the future. So that's going to be it for this time guys. I am already working on the next layout update which is an exciting one. We're going to be going back to the station module for a bit doing some work on the electrics on that. I'm going to be doing something that a lot of you have been asking am I going to do on the layout and uh, yeah, you'll have to wait till the next episode to see what that is going to be, but hopefully that won't be too far away now. In the meantime, please don't forget to subscribe, like, leave a comment, and of course hit that bell icon to get notifications, especially if you want to keep up to date with everything that is going on on the Modular Model Railway. For now though, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!